Okay, welcome once again to the plenary session and we have now uh, a presentation by Vesela Misheva from Uppsala University. Uh, there will be presentation about Jane Adams. She specialized in her biography and her dealings and what she left uh, for American and world sociology and activism also. But not mainly. Not <laughs> mainly. Okay, then Vesela, please, you have the voice. Well, thank thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this conference and uh, uh, for making me a keynote. Um, Uh, this is a part of a uh, bigger project, and this is the first time I actually I uh, gave a presentation uh, concerning the project as a whole. Um, so just to say that this is a work in progress. Um, more than 30 years ago, Mary Jo Deegan, an American feminist sociologist, opened the so-called Adams case. In one of her earlier works, she identified a pattern of exclusion and discrimination of early women sociologists who were leaders in both sociology and social work but were not considered equal participants to their male colleagues. She added, however, that the pattern of discrimination was complex and although women in general were discriminated against in academic life, some women occasionally were brought into the hierarchy due to respect to their work, as in Adam's case. Uh, in her book, perhaps well known, Jane Adams and the Men of the Chicago School, uh, Deegan drew the attention of sociologists to the fact that Adam's important contribution to the classical foundation of the discipline uh, as a social theorist of major proportions a leader and a founder was entirely overlooked. Since then, the literature on the subject has enormously increased and the question that Deegan raised in, uh, about Adams and in general about the contribution of women for the emergence of sociology at the turn of the 20th century seem to have triggered a new and much deeper than ever before sociological self-reflection. The work for recovering forgotten people, and especially for forgotten women sociologists in the history of social science, since the 2000s has been quite intense in many sciences, and including sociology. What appeared to be a new scholarly movement for reforming the history of the social sciences from which women were absent at the beginning of the 21st century was already transformed into a specialized research field which discoveries entered the classrooms. In the last two decades, Adam's name, among others, appeared in all big top-selling introductory textbooks in the field. But the fact that women sociologists have been finally let in the history of early American sociology and sociology in general, and that this history is now being rewritten, did not produce so far any revolutionary change as some expected. The suspicion that Adams in particular and women in general were included for social reasons uh, and not for real achievements and contributions to sociology still lurks in the background. Adams has been known all along as a social worker and as the most widely hailed female public figure. And her intellectualism and pacifism, for which she received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931, uh, are widely admired and acknowledged, uh, uh, and acknowledged. But why actually Adams has also to be a sociologist uh, as well? Uh, but the claims concerning her role and contribution to sociology remain unfounded and unsupported by evidence for the existence of some kind of important, lasting contribution that have been neglected and now has to be retrieved. Since sociologists are still uncertain as to Adam's sociological identity and place in sociology's history, uh, it can be said uh, that the, her intellectual heritage still remains homeless. But Adam herself has uh, had a home, and her home is well known. Her home is Hull House, the justly famous settlement house in Chicago. 
In her speeches, uh, Adams always referred to herself as Adams of Hull House. In a recent history of American sociology, it was stated that although both Hull House specifically and the settlement movement more generally have been claimed prim primarily for history of social work, they in fact figure integrally in late 19th century uh, sociology. But the problem is that Adams, the founder and the director of Hull House, has not been acknowledged to be a part of it. Much has been done in the, in the social sciences uh, since Diggins' groundbreaking work in demonstrating the presence and active engagement of women sociologists in laying the foundations of sociology as a science and establishing it as a profession. But although their names and intellectual biographies are already well known, very little progress has been made in revealing the precise nature of their contributions. The common understanding is that the quest for women sociologists who could be included in the sociological canon should be called off since none of the cases that have been considered were found to be convincing and deserving of the honor. Uh, the main goal of this research project, um, the underlying project, um, uh, the, the main goal that underlies this project is um, um, the study, uh, to study Adam's uh, published work and to identify in it the reasons why she should be considered a sociologist and her work should be read even today as a classical sociological work. In view of the fact that it is impossible to separate Adam's biography from the history of Hull House, an additional goal will be to explore the role of Hull House in the history uh, of sociology and uh, for sociologist institutionalization. Uh, this project occurs with efforts at uh, the close of the 20th century uh, undertaken by feminist scholars in particular to reconstruct the history of the social sciences during their formative years as bodies of expert knowledge, forms of social practice, and methods of cultural critique in order to discover the role of women social scientists in it. However, instead of exploring the history of social science through the lens of gender, this project explores the history of sociology through an interactionist sociolo sociological lens. Uh, well, this means that this methodological difference excludes the possibility of reaching any generalized conclusion about the role of women in the history, um, in this history, and narrows the research focus to an exploration of the role in the fundamental reorganization of the social sciences between 1889 and 1920 of one woman sociologist in particular, Jane Adams. And so, uh, who was Adams? Uh, she was a middle class woman uh, of means. Uh, with college education, she took two trips to Europe as it was fashionable at the time for all social um, scientists. Uh, so she visited um, in particular um, uh, yeah, several places that were uh, connected with the history of European science uh, and art. And so she was in Italy, she was in Germany, she was also in um, England. This was her three main destinations. Um, and um, she was very impressed by August Combe. Normally when we talk about sociologists, we are asking uh, about their uh, influences, so who influenced them and where their roots, so to say, in social science are. So uh, I would say that uh, her basic influence was August Combe, uh, but uh, not in France. And she was uh, basically in, L in London where um, she was very impressed by the positivist a kind of social movement uh, following uh, um, um, in the steps, uh, in the foots of Comte, uh, but not that Comte that we know uh, in mainstream sociology, uh, not that positivism, his positivist philosophy, but another kind of positivism that was um, the focus of his uh, uh, unknown today book that we never even mentioned to our students. Uh, this is uh, The Positive Polity. And in this book, uh, this book was considered to be uh, an evidence for uh, the fact that the father so say, of sociology was a madman. And this book is not recommended to anybody to read because it's uh, absolutely um, 
um, out of uh, you know, touch with uh, anything that we can call a scholarly work. But uh, at the same time, uh, in this um, work, there was a kind of uh, a passion for social reform, and there was a, there was a social movement uh, that also was a scholarly movement, and this was the positivist in London that Adams, uh, in particular, uh, was uh, very impressed of, and uh, she was listening to their speeches and was very um, impressed by um, their uh, wish for social reform and for um, um, actually improving uh, the social world and dealing with its ills. Uh, she also was impressed by Toynbee Hall in the East End of London and uh, by uh, Arnold Toynbee's work. And his major work is uh, the Industrial Revolution. So Arnold Toynbee is the person who coined the term Industrial Revolution. Uh, and at the end of this book, he actually had some uh, paragraphs concerning the future of society uh, and a, a, a sketch of a project of society without poverty. Uh, and so Toynbee Hall was, uh, in a sense, you know, uh, established um, um, as a kind of um, uh, tribute to Arnold Toynbee and um, was supposed to realize his dream about a world without poverty. And this was also a, a charity and a, a, a place related to the university where students could uh, do some something that we can call today social work uh, and help the poor in their free time. Uh, of course, uh, not for profit. Uh, and then she came back to the um, uh, United States and in Chicago she founded uh, Hull House, the famous settlement house uh, in the slums of Chicago, in the most depressed areas uh, of the town where the immigrants from Europe basically were um, settled down and they all were workers. When we talk about poverty, we have to um, take into account the, the workers, uh, the, the poor people in this district were workers. They were not just unemployed or uh, people without any kind of social occupation. Um, and there were about uh, 17 nationalities there in this district where she actually settled her home. So she moved from a middle class home to uh, this uh, abandoned you know, uh, home um, uh, in Hull House. Uh, and this can be uh, said to be a, a kind of huge you know, class uh, transition. Uh, and when we refer to settlement, we mean uh, settlement in the sense of moving from the middle class to uh, the, this uh, you know, poor district. And we do not mean the settlement of immigrants from Europe to the United States. And there is a much confusion in the literature about this, so that's why I want to point out that this is the case. So settlement because of the middle class people who moved in the uh, poor areas of Chicago. Uh, and uh, who was Adams? Yeah, she was a public intellectual, she was a, a popular writer, a social activist, a suffragist, um, a, a feminist, a pacifist, a social worker, a charity worker, a philanthropist, but also, and above all, a scholar, a researcher, and a sociologist. And she is more known with these other identities, and some of these identities she explicitly rejected in her um, uh, works, but of course, you know, when you already are identified, it's very difficult to remove the identity, so the label is uh, sticking there. Um, and because she was in, identified from many different uh, um, groups of people who, of course, used her name for their own purposes. Uh, but uh, so she also was a sociologist. Uh, she openly declared that her professional interests involved the American Sociological Association. She was a charter member of the American Sociological Association, published in sociological journals, gave sociological lectures, and wrote sociological books for sociological audiences and students. And especially uh, two of her books, the Dem Democracy and Social Ethics um, and uh, New Ideals of Peace are uh, deliberately written as sociological works. And she thought that, um, for example, uh, uh, the New Ideals of Peace, uh, it was meant to be a, a theoretical sociology uh, that was uh, particularly suited for adoption in the college classrooms. This is what her... Um, idea 
about this was. But of course, we have to say a few words also about Hull House, because Hull House, we are talking about Jane Eyre's of Hull House. They cannot be separated. When we talk about the identity of the one, we have to say something about the identity of the other. Um, so it is a settlement house in which social workers were lodged. This is the uh, uh, official uh, explanation, but my position is that it was not exactly a place for social works, it was something else. Created in 1889 in one of the depressed areas of Chicago, three years before the opening of the Department of Sociology in Chicago. Uh, Hall House became a center for intellectual exchanges, a meeting place for Chicago progressive intelligentsia, center for social reform. The progressivists also were lodged there. Adam's sociological career, in fact, transpired in Hull House. Uh, throughout most of it, she was a successful sociologist outside the academia, uh, and yet well established in the academic and public realms, uh, enjoying enormous popularity among professionals as academic sociologists, um, among editors, publishers, media journalists, uh, and the wider public. Uh, it was not until the beginning of the World War of World War I when Adam's pacifism, peace activism, and firm stance against the entrance of the United States in the war damaged her public and scholarly reputation, and her mutual, um, um, mutual intellectual exchanges with the Chicago sociologists ceased. So this is the beginning of the First World War that is a crucial point in you know, this development. What started up as a success story of a female sociologist working for sociology and its implication in social life ended up as a professional catastrophe. Hull House, uh, Hull House lost its role as a central institution to sociology and although Adams never left Hull House, she was also redefined as part of the social workers domain together with those women who left Hell House to build the educational and practical foundation of the social work profession after the beginning of World War I. Um, so um, um, I want to show you some pictures here. Um, let me see, yeah. Uh, just to see what I was talking about. So, okay, this is Jane Adams, one of her pictures. This is Hull House, uh, the picture above, uh, before she bought it. Then it began to grow. Uh, and I'm going to say why exactly she uh, had the ability to expand the, uh, the Hull House. Uh, okay, this is how uh, Hull House uh, neighborhood uh, looked at the time, so you see that it's a place of poverty, but this was outside and inside there were a lot of people, there was a lot of life inside and there were a lot of people also who were visiting Hill House, uh, not only those who were residents, not also who, and those who lived in the neighborhood. And of course, um, one of the definitions is that uh, Hull House was uh, also a, a, a center for um, a, a community for educated women. Uh, and this, uh, I think it's not quite true because there were a lot of men there. And this is just some of the pictures that I, uh, so, uh, these are some of the pictures that I found. Uh, so to prove that uh, there were a lot of male activities there also. So these were women and men and not just, you know, also boys, but also may were particip male uh, participants, you know, can be found among the uh, philanthropists. There were a lot of philanthropists who were supporting uh, Hell House. So this is not a, a feminist enterprise. This was a, a really popular movement and popular uh, enterprise in which uh, all people were involved. Uh, there were, of course, you know, uh, female um, uh, philanthropists also who were supporting uh, this enterprise. Um, so uh, what I want to do here, uh, um, you know, two things. Uh, first, I want to um, tell you something about the three uh, perhaps major sociological contribution uh, which I identified uh, by studying her um, work. And these are, according to me, uh, the creation of Hill House as a democratic public sphere involved in the production of sociological knowledge. The second one is the establishment of social problem work, which is different from social work, social problem work at the center of the sociological profession. And the third one is the conception of early sociology as both a science and a not-for-profit social enterprise. So not just a science, but it also has a kind of applied um, aspect uh, in its very definition as a science. 
Um, we will not look for these achievements in Adam's published work in the form of grand sociological theories on the type of, um, of, the type of those um, of Weber and Durkheim, which is how the modern sociologists, for whom sociology is nothing but theory and method, might well imagine them. I will argue that Adam's most significant but overlooked scholarly contribution was not the creation of a grand sociological theory, and that's why it was not found actually in her um, uh, heritage, but of a sociological paradigm, and that the peculiarities and the unique nature of a paradigm that was particularly created for the needs of the social science is the main reason for why it has been ignored. So it is very difficult to know what a paradigm is. And if your attention is focused on trying to find a theory, you're going to miss the paradigm. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, trying to find a theory that is grounding the, uh, that is a kind of ground, provides a ground for the emergence of sociology is absolutely impossible because sociology cannot emerge before uh, you know, the, the theory emerges and the theory cannot emerge before sociology emerges. So the theoretical contribution can be um, you know, only uh, you know, a fact when we already have a sociology that is established and that is producing already results and it has a theory. So there should be something else beyond theories or we can say beneath the theory level uh, that has given uh, the impetus of uh, sociology. Um, and um, so this, of course, does not e exclude uh, uh, the presence of other reasons for why Adam's sociological combination uh, um, um, of you know, these activities and contribution to sociology has been ignored, such as gender discrimination, but they will be regarded as being of secondary importance, not as having the status of profound cause. So the profound cause, I think, is just in the... Uh, um, not sufficient clarity what paradigm is, and of course we know the term only because of Kuhn's work that was, you know, um, created in the 70s, and only then, you know, the attention to the fact that uh, a science should have a paradigm um, um, was attracted um, in sociology. Um, okay, so then um, my uh, first point uh, about um, um, whole house as a democratic public sphere. Uh, so my analysis here is um, uh, starting with a comparison between uh, public sociology and public uh, sphere. So uh, of course, you know, the um, discussion in sociology about uh, public sociology uh, since the 2005 is well known. And Burevo was the uh, sociologist who um, ask the question of the different types of sociologists and the sociologists that have been repressed perhaps and forgotten in the history uh, of the professionalization of uh, sociology as a discipline. Um, and, um, and so he distinguished between four types of sociologists, as it is well known, professional, critical, policy, and public sociology, and his focus was in particular on the public sociology, that this is something that we um, actually have lost in the uh, development of sociology. And he asked a, a question, what is to be done, and how exactly we can do this to um, revive the public uh, sociology. Uh, and so he thought that uh, we have to recover the public spirit of sociology, uh, uh, we have to make public uh, sociology uh, a visible and leg legitimate enterprise. Um, we have to, uh, so that we have legitimacy in society as sociologists, because we, so to say, have lost not just you know, the uh, spirit of public sociology, we also somehow lost legitimacy as a uh, science that has a social function. Um, uh, then, um, uh, so this should be something like a, a movement, a social movement beyond the academy. This should be not thought of something like that takes uh, a place in uh, uh, closed academic spaces. Uh, so he also thought that this should be a, a real collaboration, a collaboration between sociology and the publics. 
Uh, and um, uh, the purpose for having this uh, sociology revived is to establish a kind of common understanding across multiple uh, boundaries uh, with the purpose you know, to have consensus and then, of course, to achieve a kind of social integration. So uh, Burvoy was looking at uh, a future, uh, a future for sociology in which it will have, I guess, exactly this kind of uh, public um, uh, function, and it will be a public sociology that is uh, socially useful. Uh, and so uh, also he taught that sociology, uh, in his work, he makes the point that sociology should be also a kind of moral science because uh, he said that sociologists are those who uh, actually really are committed to what they are doing. Uh, and even he said that uh, it requires a little bit of a sacrifice. Uh, and we all are already doing this sacrifice because we are uh, working, so to say, not, to, uh, not for salaries, not for money, but we are working for uh, making a better world. Uh, so all this is uh, based on Burrowoy's um, um, interpretation of the public sphere. Uh, but uh, he also uh, faced uh, a lot of criticism, and uh, here I will give an example with one particular criticism that I think is uh, very useful. Uh, Boynes and Fletcher, uh, they uh, made a point that um, uh, the idea of public sociology is very good, uh, but there are some problems in sociology uh, that first have to be solved. Uh, sociology has an identity crisis uh, and cannot go public because we don't know who we are. Are we a theoretician? Are uh, theoreticians? Are we practitioners? Uh, are we positivist or are we interpretivist? Uh, and so he, uh, they have a long list of you know such kind of dichotomies, uh, showing that sociologists are not just one group of people. They are a very diverse uh, uh, you know. Um, um, uh, group of people, so the, uh, we say that there are different groups of people that cannot talk with each other and have completely different understanding of what sociology is. Um, also here, you know, we can uh, find other, other uh, works in sociology like Raymond Boudon and others who are talking about uh, some, uh, crisis, and so this is not the first time that we hear about sociology having um, an identity crisis. Uh, also, uh, sociology is fragmented uh, and, uh, so to say, balkanized, uh, comprised of self-centered sociologists and cannot have one agreed upon public face. So if you want to have a public face, you more or less you know, have to agree upon what is that which should be included in this public face. Sociological knowledge has no satisfactory cumulative growth corresponding to its efforts. And uh, so now the question is what is to be done? And um, so the two authors suggest that we should have a kind of theory-driven research program in sociology. We have to work towards this goal to develop this kind of theory-driven research program and then we can become public sociologists. Uh, but uh, of course you know, there is a problem with this um, um, idea because um, um, so if you want to have public sociology, uh, you also have to uh, talk about who the agency of uh, this public sociology will be and what is the structure that is going to support it. Um, so uh, here I have a um, you know, few points about this. Um, so uh, Burrowoy and um, Habermas um, have very similar theories. This already has been discussed in the literature that actually Burrowoy is doing very, something very, very similar to that which Habermas is doing. Uh, and they have indeed uh, some kind of common features, but they have also some common problems. And so the problem with the theorizing, for example, at both this public sociology and this um, um, public sphere is that uh, these theories do not theorize actually the agency of the public figure. So who is the public sociology? What kind of self this public sociology should have? Uh, what does it make a self, you know, to be uh, capable of uh, understanding the other, of taking the other's concern, uh, concerns and to um, um, improve your own um, understanding and to, you know, produce the kind of action that also reflects this uh, 
um, kind of concerns, the other's concerns. And so the bourgeois public sphere, um, actually the agency of the bourgeois public sphere only summarizes and articulates its own interest in the form of public demand, uh, and it cannot uh, actually be really considered to be a public because it has boundaries. It restricts the access to this public sphere. For example, uh, as the feminist um, uh, have discovered a long time ago. Uh, you know, for example, women were not included in this kind of public sphere. So which means that uh, uh, the public sphere becomes representative. Only representative, um, uh, representatives of particular uh, groups are included and uh, it is not public in the real sense of the world of the word. Um, and there is also a problem, problems with the theorizing of the social structure, where exactly the public uh, social sphere is supposed to be located. And I have here a, a little figure. Um, okay, so first of all, uh, the uh, controversy, Luhmann and Habermas, uh, which is well known, um, have articulated a particular structure uh, of uh, the uh, relationship between life, work, and social system, uh, and the public sphere was supposed to come in between as a kind of um, um, uh, metaphor almost uh, as a kind of uh, link between uh, the social systems that are social institution and, so, and political structures and the life world that is forces of life production. And this of course very much reminds us of Marx's superstructure and base. Uh, and then the public sphere is supposed to connect them um, but the problem is that the public sphere includes only particular type of people who are representing the life world. And the, all the diversity of you know, the, the people from the life world with their different concerns as well are not participants in this public sphere. And so when we summarize the opinions, we actually summarize the opinions only of particular type of people and not uh, of all of them. Um, and so uh, we can say also that Burroy and Habermas um, have a particular blind spot, common spot, that uh, uh, they actually didn't see um, um, Hull House as um, a public sphere. And of course, they didn't pay attention so much to Adams as a public sociologist. Um, uh, so in particular, uh, Burroy mentioned her only once, I think, in one of his... Um, uh, early publications. Um, but uh, the point is that neither Burroy nor Habermas actually can give explanation to some um, uh, you know, phenomena, to some uh, questions that are related to the emergence of uh, public sociology or, public, uh, or the public sphere that we can, for example, uh, come uh, up to if we uh, pay attention to uh, the example that uh, Hull House represent, represents as a public sphere. Um, so they cannot, for example, answer the question why and how public sociology and the public sphere deteriorated and withered away. So we have to revive them, but why exactly, you know, they are not actually present today? What are the social conditions that actually condition their disappearance, so to say, from the social world? Uh, this also suggests that they will be not able to articulate the conditions under which these two public social productive forces can be brought back to life and restored. If you know, if you know how they disappeared, maybe you'll know how they will be uh, revived. Neither theory um, can theorize the origins and go back to the time before there was a need for a public sphere uh, or a public sociology. Um, and so they are not sufficiently historical in this sense. Um, and uh, so the question is, what was the social condition that the agent of social change came to shape, um, attaching to it a social form and function? What was the need of public sociology? And uh, we can find the answers of this question if we read uh, questions, if we read, for example, Jane Addams' work. Um, something that was articulated in some of the early uh, textbooks in sociology was that sociology emerged very much in opposition to politics, especially to socialist movements uh, who wanted to um, uh, produce a kind of change in the world, uh, according to Adams, but also Small and other American um, Chicago sociologists, uh, wanted to produce a change, but they didn't know enough about the people that they wanted to actually take care of, and they didn't know enough about the world that they want to improve. 
And so this was the uh, main idea on the background, you know, for the emergence of sociology, that we need a science that knows exactly what the people think, what they need, and what are the problems of the social, uh, of the life world, that we can then have a policy that exactly meets these requirements and not just, you know, fight for revolution. So that's why the reform movement is really a kind of different movement. It's not exactly um, the, the sociological movement that we can find find in Europe, it was a little bit with a different accent, and the accent was on reform. Um, and so uh, now my um, conception is that uh, we can actually regard Hull House as a public sphere. Um, and uh, so why exactly we can say that this is a public sphere? Because uh, it, it has an image of what today would be called a public sphere. And it was something that first was constructed in Adam's imagination. We can find actually the idea uh, in uh, her early works, one of which is Cassandra, a very early essay that she wrote um, about different social realms and the need actually to unite them, to overcome the boundaries between them. Um, and. Um, and so it was first an idea in the, her imagination that then she wanted to realize uh, in practice, and that's why Hull, was, uh, Hull, ha Hull House was uh, actually established. The public sphere's agency uh, presupposes a self. This is her understanding. So capable, she didn't use the word self, but uh, capable of taking the other's perspective and attitude and making itself into an object to itself, of itself. Uh, so this is uh, in the background of uh, the theory of symbolic interactionism as well. So this was a practice established that is based on just some imagination, some ideas that were not articulated in the form of theory, but they can be found in her works. Uh, so this is a truly democratic public sphere because it was taught without borders, without any gender or whatever bias. So this is very, uh, you know, prominent feature of uh, Hell House that it didn't discriminate against absolutely any kind of groups or population. There were even anarchists there. There were socialists. There were uh, more conservatives. There were all, all kind of social sciences were represented. There were um, dialogues that especially were um, directed towards uh, coming to a kind of agreement between all these different uh, social forces and uh, agents, so to say. Um, and um, it actually, uh, if we say that this is a public sphere, we can say that also this is the public arena, the first public arena in which sociology learned to play a public role and acquired a voice. So they, uh, they say that there was no reform in which Jane Addams was not actually involved, but this is not so much to, to be taught like Jane Addams. This was the authority of sociology that began to build on the basis of the activity in Hell House. For example, they created um, maps and um, uh, of uh, the area, so um, they, they have some quantitative studies there also. Uh, they have qualitative studies, so this was also a kind of research center for sociology, but not a laboratory. Why? Because the people there were participants in the discussions and not objects of sociological investigation. And here comes the big, big disagreement between the Chicago sociologists, the Department of Sociology, and uh, Jane Adams and the uh, settlement um, sociologists, who thought that uh, uh, they cannot have the uh, people who are living in the neighborhood, their neighbors, as objects of sociological investigation. The only thing that they can do with them is just to have them as equals, as sociological, um, as, uh, um, as uh, uh, partners, interaction partners, who also have some knowledge about life. So the knowledge of life is not a privilege of the sociological thinkers who sit in their offices, but the knowledge of life is out there and it is uh, so to, to be uh, retrieved, you know, from some kind of common discussion in which common discussion in which everybody can be included. Um, okay, so uh, some other uh, features of this uh, public sphere. Uh, so it ma its main function, as it can be retrieved from Adams' Adams' work, is social integration and personal empowerment. 
Um, here on the background lurks uh, the uh, idea of um, uh, Bourdieu. So this is the cultural capital. So you create something there that uh, actually can empower all of the participants. Um, she herself used the word, word authority, uh, authority, authority, authoritas, um, and uh, she thought that everybody should um, have part of this authority at the end, so they all will uh, become, you know, authoritative people. Hmm. Um, um, so, okay, uh, a public sphere also is a means of social reform and non-violent social change. Uh, it was meant to bring about sociological enlightenment. There are references in her work exactly that this should be a kind of enlightening um, um, experience for all the people. Uh, this is a, um, a public sphere um, uh, which is non-political and secular sphere. And my main point here that we cannot think about the public sphere as a kind of semi-superstructure uh, in uh, you know, relation to Marx's model, uh, but rather we can think about um, the public sphere as an understructure. So if we talk about superstructures, in, if we talk about replacement of superstructure, we're talking about revolutions. So here we are talking about uh, uh, so, uh, healing the wounds of the social life, the ills, by constructing something that is beneath the uh, all different social structures that have been constructed. So this is something that should be rooted in social life, in everyday life, uh, and has to support all uh, other structures in society, and not just to be a kind of another superstructure that will you know, um, take care of the disadvantages of the previous structures. So this is the idea of social understructure. Um, so uh, also uh, Adams talks about uh, settlement sociology. My uh, idea is that th this is a par excellence public sociology uh, where the sociologists are collaborating with the public. Uh, they collectively produce truth. They made sociologies visible and legitimate enterprise. You know, it had enormous authority at that time, which we cannot even imagine, you know, sociology to have in nowadays. Um, and um, um, so this sociology is also uh, something like a social movement. Before, it was considered to be a kind of uh, uh, sign of uh, immatur immaturity. So if sociology is a social movement, it's not a real science. But the idea is that sociology should be uh, a social science, but also a social movement, because it has to involve the public, uh, and so it has to be oriented towards uh, consensus and integration. Um, so um, the main function of uh, public sociology, uh, briefly we say, is to create a truly public social sphere and bring about a sociological environment. But the question is where exactly this social, uh, you know, uh, this uh, public um, sociology has to be located. The location is where there is a concentration of unusual number of differences. It's not in the place where everybody almost, you know, thinks the same. So this is a place where everybody thinks differently, and so the point is that we have a place for a function of integration, uh, and this is a social enterprise. The profession implies commitment and sacrifice, exactly like Burrovoy said. So that's why I can find some uh, common features described, uh, you know, by Burrovoy um, and also by um, Adams. Uh, so uh, my next point, my next point is uh, that um, um, uh, sociology uh, at that time, you know, at Hull House, uh, had a particular enterprise. And this enterprise was a social enterprise, and if you uh, read the literature on social enterprise and social entrepreneurship, you will uh, actually see that the ideas are very similar. Um, and um, uh, so there were a lot of um, uh, sociologists after Adam's death, after uh, 1935, so that began talking about the construction of social problems, that social problems are not so, something objectively existing. If there was something objectively existing, then we can talk about revolutions, about um, changing the world and so on. But the point is that we have to change the way people think. We have to change their minds. We have to construct new selves. And this is something that sociologists have to do. This is their mission. And so uh, in all these works that I... Uh, um, quote here, you know, Waller, Fuller, and so uh, also including Bloomer, 1971. Um, 
the idea was that uh, perhaps there was something that sociologists could have done that they have been doing in the past, but now it's lost. But especially this is uh, uh, to be found in Bloomer's work, uh, where he says that sociology has been alienated from what should properly have been its main social function. Uh, and um, so briefly uh, stated, the social function of sociology is to um, is the so-called uh, social problem work. Uh, Donnelyn Lossike, the symbolic interactionist, has a book on the construction of social problems, and there uh, she actually picks up exactly this kind of history of the problem, and although she doesn't uh, make reference to Bloomer, but Bloomer was also one of the um, symbolic interactionists who uh, point uh, our attention to the fact that there was something that sociology was doing, and now who are the people who are doing this? These are the politicians. These are the social media. The sociologists, Lossike said, are in the audience. We have to be just the observers who, uh, you know, like members of the audience, we can perhaps say something, but we will not have the authority that our voice will be heard because now it's a matter of politics. It's not a matter of sociology. Um, so this is the law sociological enterprise. Um, just a few, few more, so please. Uh, uh, social problem work, the main essence of the sociological enterprise at Hull House and um, uh, the unity of sociology was lost, I think, with the neglect of Adam's work. So the whole enterprise that gave meaning to sociology and that make it legitimate science with authority. So this is gone with the um, neglect of uh, this particular part of sociological history. Um, and so now there is something like sociology of social problems, but it is not exactly um, counting on the same agency, on the same um, uh, social structure, uh, scientific structure as before. Um, and so I uh, actually compare a sociology uh, as a science and a social price, a so, uh, enterprise to uh, what Adams, um, um, I, I actually interpret Adams' inter understanding of sociology as a, both sociology as, science, as a science and a social enterprise. Um, and um, so she was herself a social entrepreneur and this does not conflict with her uh, understanding of what sociology is. Um, and she left actually in her works uh, uh, very early definitions of what social entrepreneurship is that very much resemble the definitions that uh, Schumpeter left. And so now the social entrepreneur, uh, uh, te uh, social entrepreneurship scholarship, you know, they are in pains to find a definition. They cannot uh, actually, uh, you know, come to an agreement what social entrepreneurship is. But if you look at uh, Hull House and uh, at her, uh, Adam's work, so maybe you can find. Uh, definition um, and um, uh, so uh, there are some analysis of Adam's work that uh, actually criticize her that it is it is rich but it's not theoretical it's spread thin and this is supposed to be something very um, uh, you know, uh, something that actually the, disqualifies uh, its work as a sociological work. And the pro problem is that, um, uh, so people are looking uh, to find some kind of theories in her work. But if you say that we are not looking for theories, but we are looking for a paradigm, which is a kind of under theory, something that comes before the theory, because this uh, paradigm was constructed at the time when there was no sociology. As I said, three years before the con con creation of the Department of Sociology. So what do you uh, have to do? So what do you start with? You build a kind of common world view. Where do you build this view? You go to the slums. We, you go where the problems are and involve all the people in the construction of a kind of uh, platform on which you can build theoretical um, um, knowledge in the future. Um, okay, so I, I said that this is beneath, you know, so the paradigm is supposed to be beneath the theory. It's not something like a meta theory. Um, so uh, there are particular features of a paradigm. It doesn't have a standpoint. So feminist theories uh, are talking about standpoints. So the point here is that a paradigm does not have a standpoint. It doesn't have any bias. You know, it is a world view. It's a world view that everybody can share, regardless of where you stand, you can share it. So this is what I mean that, uh, you know, that we have to first understand what a paradigm is in order to recognize the paradigm in Adam's work. Um, 
And um, so uh, also it's based on subjective knowledge. But we say, um, okay, so after especially Popper, you know, uh, knowledge is objective only when it's uh, capable of being falsified. But here, you know, the point is exactly the opposite. We have to find knowledge that cannot be falsified. The subjective knowledge cannot be fal falsified. Uh, and so how do, we, how do we recognize the paradigm when you see it? So this is the main uh, you know, problem. So it's micro, macro, it doesn't look like a theory. Uh, it also has to kind of have to, um, a kind of exemplar, and this example, I think, can be found in democracy and social ethics. Uh, and it is born on a very special location. Where? Uh, in Chicago. Why in Chicago? Because this was the center of the world at the time. Uh, because the whole, world's there, well, the whole world was there to build the second industrial revolution's um, uh, in reality. Um, and so uh, why Hull House? Because there were so many immigrants there, because Europe was there, the whole was, world was there also to build the new world and to build the new kind of knowledge that we need in order to make it better. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We have some minutes for comments and uh, questions, not much. I will not take time, uh, please. I will not take your time. Somebody wants to comment. I have one question, such a one question. When I learn about sociology and about symbolic interactions uh, in Chicago school in the 70s at my university and 80s, I haven't known anything about Jane Addams. And tell me why she was, uh, why she hasn't been uh, recognized for so long. Maybe at my university it was, but probably not. Uh, what it happened? The sociology is, uh, is a process connected with the society. I don't know if it has something common with the society that influenced mm -hmm. yeah. society, mm, I think about media, yeah. concrete mm -hmm. uh, yeah. activity, yeah. maybe it has something to do. It was uh, strange for me when I looked back now, she was so important and she had contact with uh, George Herbert Mead, yes, also. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then why it happened? It's very, um, but don't answer, maybe somebody, uh, <laughs> if there will be no questions, then you can answer. Okay, but you should use uh, microphone because we have live streaming still then. Uh, thank you very much indeed for um, your talk and, and obviously your thorough engagement with, I agree wholeheartedly, um, a neglected field and contribution to the sociological canon and it's good to see that coming to the fore uh, and being recognised. Um, I guess my, my, my question or query is uh, quite sem semantic, I suppose, and maybe a bit dull as a consequence, but uh, the term paradigm, it seems to me very tainted very loaded, very shot through with certain connotations. And I really agree with your analysis um, that uh, where we're at now demands a kind of re-appreciation uh, of how knowledge exchanges work. And they don't work necessarily in that, that kind of you know, meta-narrative, big grand narrative kind of way of, uh, of the early discipline. So I wonder if, um, if paradigm doesn't help your argument because people you know, uh, see it in a different way. It is too kind of tainted. And if there's a different way to capture the complexity of, of how knowledge exchanges do work, I was thinking about Greg Smith's paper um, earlier to, to, on Goffman, where he talked about uh, the exchanges between Everett Hughes and Goffman and the correspondence, and that those very informal moments and influences on, on an individual's careers and how knowledge exchanges operate. So, is there, is there a better way to, to capture the kind of uh, the argument that you're, you're, you're talking about and knowledge exchanges in contemporary academia? Um, yeah, so as, as uh, it concerns the historical uh, part of my project, um, so I don't think that we have to um, particularly prove that this is really a paradigm because of this and this kind of criteria, although I, I do this. Uh, but uh, if we uh, try to see what sociologists are doing today, 
I think that um, we can trace back almost everything that we're doing today to some discussions that existed at that time and that some of them were taking place in Hull House. Um, and uh, this is a very rich uh, interaction that uh, really provided a kind of foundation for sociology. Um, and um, exactly as some symbolic interactionists say, uh, you know, whatever you uh, try to focus on in sociology, uh, at the bottom it's, it's all symbolic interaction, so everything is symbolic interaction. <laughs> uh, but this is exactly the case with, uh, you know, this uh, kind of discussions, um, so that we can recognize modern sociology if we look at the discussions at the turn of the 20th century. So she wrote about absolutely all possible problems that we have still today. Uh, none of these problems, of course, are solved. This is a very interesting you know, phenomenon, which actually um, uh, says something about the perhaps truthfulness of the constructivist perspective. Uh, they are just constructed anew, but none of them are solved, which means that the disagreement, however, you know, remains. Um, and she had, uh, you know, this idea of constructing this kind of public social sphere, democratic uh, public sphere, in which actually sociology to have the proper environment to grow and develop and to become this kind of integrative factor in society. So now the, the point is that uh, if you uh, have a particular, uh, in a particular moment of the development of society, perhaps you will not need such kind of force. And this is answer, also an answer to Krzysztof's question. So uh, Adams had only one theory, and this theory was uh, not very successful. And this was her theory uh, about peace, so theory of peace. Uh, and she thought that because, um, so this is uh, her, her new ideals of peace, uh, because um, uh, there are so many immigrants, you know, in these uh, new towns, industrial towns, uh, it will be impossible to have um, a, a war, you know, a world war, because uh, this will mean that the people who are representing the world, you know, are also there, you know, they cannot fight against, you know, their own people back home. And she was proved wrong. Uh, and this was, so to say, the decline of the concession because there was something that actually was not true. But this is her theory. So theories are to be falsified. They change under different conditions. So that's my difference between paradigm and theory. But the paradigm is not falsified. So the theories can actually be falsified and that's why they are theories because they can be proved in a, at a later date or they can be misproved and uh, disproved and they can be replaced by new theories. Um, so in the, from this point of view, I think that uh, we just can have to say that sociology is not um, a kind of lost science, but it is a new science. Why should we search for the roots of sociology in Europe? Europe is, uh, so to say, the birthplace of uh, all you know, classical uh, social science and other sciences. Uh, it's Europe. But we have uh, a new science that uh, emerged under completely different conditions. And, and my focus here is also on the difference between the first industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution, which is a mass scale industrial revolution, a mass scale. This is a completely different uh, kind of uh, um, uh, social um, uh, atmosphere and cons the consequences were really, you know, much more dramatic. And Adams wrote her work reflecting on these consequences and trying to do something about that world and not, you know, reflecting on the situation in Europe. You no, know, in Europe, it was, the emphasis was on revolution. In the United States, it was on reform. Why? In Europe, there were no philanthropists wanting to support sociology. In America, there were. Now, there were people who really wanted to support in order to heal the ills that you know, this industrial revolution produced because it was really on a mass scale. Uh, the whole tissue of society was, so to say, torn. Uh, and sociology came to repair something that has been done to, to this society, you know, to, to these people. Understanding the people, understanding the... So not just a, a revolution will not actually be the cure, but they, they wanted to repair what has been you know, torn so apart. Um, and if we have um, uh, you know, similar conditions, you know, sociology also will have this kind of uh, role in society again. Public role. So I don't think that the public sociology, uh, like you know, in Burroughs' case, is something that we should always have 
in uh, the history of society. Sociology always should be in the slums, and also I hope that you know, there will be no slums forever. But sociology is appearing, so emerging as a public factor when there is a need of such kind of sociology. And we have, you know, in Europe, we have exactly the same problems now as in the uh, United States in the turn of the century. So Chicago, you know, with the enormous uh, amount of immigrants, you know, uh, people from different cultures who cannot talk the same language, who cannot even, you know, share some religious perspectives. So all biases had to be, you know, put under the carpet. So we cannot talk about, you know, differences anymore. So all differences had to be integrated. But Europe is much, much more, uh, uh, it's not Americanized, but it looks like, uh, you know, the American world in the, at the end of the 19th century because of this immigration uh, processes here. And we have uh, big uh, problems in some societies, how to integrate society, you know. Uh, and the point is not to assimilate people, but, you know, just to involve them in a kind of interaction and, you know, produce perhaps some kind of new types of institutions that will be tolerant, you know, to, towards this kind of diversity. So this was my... Okay, some more questions? Okay, Andrea, please. Yes, thank you, Vesela, for your inspiring presentation. It was very good. And you succeed in update the thought of Jane Addams and uh, let this thinking more actual and at the present day, but I'm a little bit afraid about um, some uh, scenario that we have in front concerning two points. There are many points that probably they are worth a uh, reflection, but the first is what is not convincing is the definition of public sociology, because if you think about a public sociology, you have to think about a private sociology, it's from a conceptual point of view. And, and so my difficulty is understanding where is the private dimension of the sociology, because it is clear what is the public dimension, but it is not clear what, what could be the private dimension. So public and private pertain to people and not to sociology. Yeah, yeah. So this is my, my first comment and my, my first perplexity, so I would like to share with you. And the second is, uh, we are in an um, academic world in, in which there is a strong um, uh, strong division of academic job. So we have sociology, we have uh, social work, and you were very attentive in, in the distinction between social problem work and social work. Mm -hmm. But probably um, the, what, what you mean uh, is to build um, a dimension in between sociology and social work. But it is very difficult to, to build, and the risk is to have a sociology in the academic world, social world as a technical profession, and an in-between dimension, and that is probably the public sphere in which sociology uh, is active, that is difficult to understand as a profession, as a... Um, so to say, has a perspective for young people that say, hmm, what I'm, I am studying, I'm studying sociology for the public sphere or sociology for academic dimension, or I want to be a social worker. It's, uh, it's, it, it is not clear to me what, what will mm. mean mm. Uh, from a practical point of view to build such kind of sociology. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so I, if I understood your questions, there are two questions. One is about the public and the private, and the other about social work and uh, social problem work or sociology. Um, yeah, the first question, uh, so public sociology is not uh, um, exactly, perhaps not in the same uh, 
understood, to be understood in the same terms because it's not opposed to a private sociology that deals with the private problems of the individual, but rather it's opposed to um, that sociology which is uh, taking uh, just some parts of the uh, you know, problems and makes them into public. Because in principle, sociology also is concerned about making public uh, private concerns. Uh, so the public sphere has a particular function here, and sociology also can contribute to this. Uh, but uh, I think that we, con we, the opposition is between a private sociology that will be done, you know, in your office, you know, you're done privately, the kind of sociology that you think that will uh, count for the whole world, but this is just, you know, a, a kind of private perspective, and the public sociology that is produced by, uh, you know, uh, arranging this kind of interaction between all participants, all people who have some experiences, and with the idea that everybody has knowledge, which is, uh, you know, dramatically, uh, uh, so the perspective about the production of knowledge is dramatically changed here. Knowledge is not something that some people can have and others cannot. But knowledge is something that everybody has. The point is, you know, and it's subjective knowledge, but it's true. Who can, for example, um, uh, who can prove that uh, the person who feels pain does not feel this pain? You know, you say, no, this objectively, you don't have pain, you know. So who cares about our, you know, estimation of what the others have? You know, the point is that everybody has knowledge, everybody has something to say. The point is how to summarize these points and to make this kind of objective view. And this is the public sociology that takes, you know, all kind of perspectives and makes them, so according to Habermas too, all the visions are supposed to, you know, uh, flow into one. And this, this is the perspective that is supposed to be the basis for uh, social uh, evaluations and social policy. Um, so this is the first question. The second question, uh, I didn't have time to develop this uh, issue. Uh, so uh, Adams is a social entrepreneur and this is one of her enterprises that she created. But she didn't, I wanted to say that she herself was not a social worker because she didn't identify herself with this work and to continue to do this. But she was the creator because she had this idea. She wrote about the charity uh, work. Uh, she, she herself was doing charity work, but she was criticizing one particular point, which is absolutely different from the social problem work. Uh, she was criticizing the idea about social work having clients. Uh, as I said, and she uh, was more into uh, this kind of interaction, dialogue with uh, the people and not so much making them into uh, patients or clients. Uh, and that's why I make a distinction between two, time, two types of uh, social entrepreneurship, um, and, um, so which is not reflected here in my work, but social work is uh, social entrepreneurship for profit. In, in the literature, you have this big discussion for profit and non-for-profit. Uh, and uh, so it is uh, actually said that social entrepreneurship can be, you know, a social mission, you know, the people can be uh, having uh, some kind of moral concerns, they're driven by social mission, but, you know, they do this not just, you know, because they're very inspired, they are not do-gooders, you know, they have particular, you know, this is a profession, they have particular um, um, a profit from this, uh, but they are having some kind of moral concerns too. So they are social entrepreneurs too. But social uh, problem work, uh, this is what actually Baravoy has in my public sociology. This is supposed to be not for profit. This is for people who are committed and uh, they are you know, sacrificing themselves. He said, all of us who are working in sociology are sacrificing ourselves because we are not well paid. And so it's, it's, this is a sacrifice. Um, so uh, it is a part of sociology, but there are two types of social entrepreneurships. Uh, okay, thank you. We finished. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for the question and attendance. Thank you. And now we have the lunch break. <laughs>